Okay, we are studying Cain and Abel. We got about halfway through Cain last Wednesday night, so we'll finish up Cain and uh, probably try to finish up Abel as well this evening. Uh, as I mentioned last week, the next study is going to be on the Apostles. Uh, everybody, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the way through uh, Paul as well. Uh, and I'll have those, at least the first four Apostles. Uh, we'll probably split that up into three separate notes because I won't be able to fit them all on, on one page. But um, we'll have those available Sunday for everybody to, to pick up. So, uh, as we noted in Jude, well, we, first we started in Genesis chapter 4 last week. And we noticed uh, Genesis chapter 4 where the majority of the references to Cain and Abel are in the Old Testament. It's in Genesis chapter 4. However, both uh, Cain and Abel have three separate places where they're referenced uh, technically four, although one is a second record from Matthew to Luke. Uh, but both have three separate references in the New Testament as well. And we looked at Genesis 4 where Cain uh, he was a tiller of the ground. He killed his brother Abel after God rejected his sacrifice, uh, but he had accepted Abel's. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 tells us that by faith Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And then uh, we noticed as well that 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12, John actually kind of explains a little bit or at least kind of delves into why Cain's sacrifice was rejected, and that's in a context of, of loving one another, not like Cain, who killed his brother, which is in contrast to loving our brethren, and also why was Cain's sacrifice rejected? Because his brother's works were righteous and his works were evil. Uh, and then here in Jude verse 11, as Jude is describing the character of the false teachers that are going to be a, a major problem for the saints to whom Jude is writing, he describes them, verse 11, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Three individuals who are regarded as evil or sinful in the Old Testament. Korah, of course, led a rebellion against Aaron and Moses. Uh, they were not content with having been assigned uh, as priests of the, of the tabernacle of God. They were not content with where they were and what they had been given, and they wanted more. And ultimately, they were murmuring and leading kind of a rebellion against, against God, ultimately. And God opened the earth and swallowed up Korah and those who were following him. Uh, but he describes, Jude describes the character of these false teachers as they have, for they have. And then he says, they have perished in the rebellion of Korah. And it almost, it almost sounds like what he's describing are individuals who might very well at one time have been Christians. But for multiple reasons, they have fallen away or have their, their motivation has turned to that which is selfish and ambitious and seeking their own um, influence and their own power, their own prestige. And as a result, this is why Jude describes them the way that he does. Peter describes them very similarly uh, as well. And so when he describes the error of Balaam, remember Balaam, he was, uh, to be, he was wanting to be paid by... Balak to curse the children of Israel. And God, it sounds as though he literally could not curse the children of Israel. It wasn't that he was persuaded not to, it was that God wouldn't let him. And so in order to kind of loophole around that problem, he taught Balak to, taught, to teach the children of Israel, okay, here's how you can kind of get around this. I don't have to curse them, they can curse themselves if you'll teach them to worship idols. And of course, attached to worshiping idols, there was fornication and so, so forth. And so there was that teaching of the children of Israel, the, the worship of idols then led to ultimately the curse of Israel. And that was kind of Balaam's kind of loophole. Ultimately, Balaam paid for that. He was killed by the children of Israel by commandment of God. But they have run greedily in the error of Balaam which is to say that they had ulterior motives in the things that they were doing. They had selfish and greed uh, kind of aspirations about them. So then verse 11, or, or the first part of verse 11, for they have gone 
in the way of Cain. Now, Jude doesn't elaborate as to what he means by that. What do you think? Remember, we, uh, Peter talks about why was, was Cain's sacrifice rejected? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. We look at Genesis chapter 4. We see that God rejected both Cain and his sacrifice. So what do you think Jude is referring to in verse 11 when he says they've gone in the way of Cain? If we're talking about characteristics of false teachers here, what could he be talking about? A progression of sin. Right? It's similar to what we read in James about how no man is, is tempted by God, but rather he is enticed by his own desires, and then uh, he commits sin, and then sin brings forth death, and there's a progression to that what happens. And in fact, what Cain did, okay, I, I, and you could argue that whatever he offered to God in terms of a sacrifice, you could argue whether or not you would consider or God would have considered that a sinful sacrifice. It doesn't say specifically, but he rejected it. So it wasn't a, an approved sacrifice. And we'll talk more about why God rejected it in a little bit. But Cain had the opportunity to change his course, didn't he? In fact, God even came to him, asked him, why is your countenance fallen? Because Cain was very obviously angry and frustrated. And God even warned him in Genesis chapter 4, verse 11, I think it was. We'll go back there here in a little bit. And he says, in essence, you have an opportunity to choose what is right. And you have to be careful and make the choice to choose what is right. But Cain didn't. The very next thing we see is Cain talking to Abel in the field. And then he rises up and kills him. So yeah, you kind of see a progression here of... This turning away from, and presumably at some point, Cain loved his brother, you would think, at some point. But then, because of jealousy, because of envy, because of anger, he then was moved to kill his brother, which is ultimately why Peter says Cain's the opposite of loving your brother. But you kind of have this progression, which again goes back to the thought process that who Jude is referring to might very well have been faithful at one time Christians who have now fallen away seeking their own, uh, their own ambition, having ulterior evil, sinful motives. And so Cain, Balaam, and Korah are all referenced as showing kind of that progression of falling away. Thoughts or comments through that? Okay, not you. All right, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Let's go back here real quick, and let's look at uh, what we see God tell, uh, tell Cain. So we see here in verse 13, uh, well, starting in verse 10. God says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Now, why is it or how is it that Cain is going to end up being a fugitive and a vagabond? Why? How is that going to work? Whatever he does, it's not going to work. I mean, whatever he tries to work or produce or anything, it's not going to work. And he's going to have to steal. He, so, in, in essence, no matter where he settles, he will not be able to bear the fruit of the ground. Okay? And, and again, he's a tiller of the ground. That's what he does. So, wherever he goes, he's not going to have any fruit from the ground. So ultimately, he's not really going to be able to really settle anywhere, at least not for the, for the purpose of farming uh, or for the purpose of gaining fruit from the ground or from trees. Uh, maybe he could have you know, become an animal herder or whatever. But regardless, God says you're going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. And in verse 13, 
My punishment, Cain says, is greater than I can bear. Now, keep in mind, as far as we know, up to this point, now we do find at the end of Genesis chapter 4 that Cain will build a city later. Uh, but at this point, we don't read of any cities or, or large congreg congregants of people, of, of, of individuals in a single location. Now, there might very well have been, but at this point, I'm, I'm thinking, why is Cain, why does he think my punishment is greater than I can bear? Uh, and, and the only thing I can figure is that this means that, that how am I supposed to survive? And no matter what I do, anywhere I go, people are going to know. Well, what people? Presumably, we're talking about sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And for that matter, maybe any other children that may have come. We don't read of any children from Abel, and there's no genealogy giving us anything about Abel. But certainly of Cain and of ultimately Seth and any other children that Adam and Eve may have had. But what he says in verse 14, he says, Surely you have driven me out of this out this day from the face of the ground i shall be hidden from your face i shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me obviously cain considers the fact that there are other people in the world at this point okay again those other people would have had to have been children from adam and eve we don't read of any other creation of god from dust rather than Adam and Eve. So anyone, any other human beings had to come from Adam and Eve. And so whether Cain's looking ahead or Adam and Eve had con have continued to have children on, you know, through after Cain, after Abel or whatnot, again, the genealogies that we have focus on Cain and Seth, that doesn't mean though that there weren't others. Okay, but those were the ones that Cain, were given Cain's genealogy up to a certain point, And then Seth's genealogy continues on through Noah after the flood. But uh, he accounts for the fact that no matter where I go, people are going to know. And I'm not going to have you to protect me. And I'm not going to be able to settle anywhere out in the middle of nowhere because I won't be able to live because the earth won't produce its fruit. What am I supposed to do? Verse 15, the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain... Vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold, and the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Now, how, how it was that God made it clear to everyone, again, there may not have been a whole lot of people at this point. It might have been very easy for that message to spread. But one way or the other, God made sure that everyone knew that no one was to kill Cain. Uh, and it says God set a mark on Cain. This would have been something distinguishing him as don't, don't harm him. Don't touch him. It's not that God was necessarily protecting Cain per se. It was more along the lines of the punishment for Cain wasn't just death. It was having to live and not just for 30 years or 50 years, but for hundreds of years as a fugitive and a vagabond. And that might also be a part of why Cain says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. It's not like, well, I've only got 40 years left to live anyway or so, you know. No, they lived for hundreds and hundreds. Adam lived for like 900 and something years. So Cain is going to live presumably for probably about the same amount of time, 800, 900 years. And so he knows that this is going to be multi-generational, many, many generations that he's going to have to be a fugitive and a vagabond. Now, can you imagine in the movie The Fugitive with Harrison Ford kind of living in that state, not just for a couple of weeks or a month or a year, but for hundreds of years? Okay, and so you can kind of understand why Cain was, I can't bear this. Well, you shouldn't have killed your brother, but that's kind of beside the point. That's what God, the punishment was. All right, thoughts or comments through that. And we'll talk more about specifically the mark and all that here in a minute. Nolan? Do you see at the end of verse 14 when he's saying, hey, you better find it, I feel me, it's suggesting there was already a law in place. We talked about this a little bit last week, that God's always had or given a law. Yeah. Yeah. What it was. You know, chapter 9, the Lord's going to stay to Noah. Was it original? Was it a repeat? 
whoever sheds man's blood, you know, his blood needs to be shed for it. Right. But it just seems to be an indicator to me, again, that God had already given laws or principles. Yeah. You know, and if you'll recall, in the Mosaical Law, there were cities of refuge uh, that uh, individuals who were guilty of killing a family member, uh, they could run to these cities of refuge, if I remember correctly, and the, the family member for whom they were going to take vengeance on the murderer, they couldn't touch them in the city of refuge. Am I right on that? that that's correct, right? Unless you left the city. Unless you left the city. And so it, may, it makes me think about going back to the idea of law, that if everyone knows what Cain did, if the punishment for that were death by, by the people who lived, not necessarily by God, although God certainly could have killed Cain, he didn't, uh, but if the law stated whatever law they had, that someone who is a vagabond or someone who is maybe stealing to survive or whatnot, maybe that punishment is death. Maybe if an individual, they know that this person has murdered somebody and they've escaped, you know, and you find them, you're supposed to kill them. I mean, we don't know exactly what the situation was that convinced Cain that anyone who finds me is going to kill me or want to, come, want to kill me. Uh, but it does seem as though there may have been a little bit of background regarding perhaps whatever law God had given them that may have spoken to that. And that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. If you didn't have a later where God very clearly is in favor of capital punishment, yeah. I mean, he will state that later. It would almost seem like here he's trying to prevent murder from happening. I mean, we think of oh, Cain was the first guy who did murder. But somehow his statement just intrigues me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was the first one that did it. What? You know, why would he even think that? Yeah. Anyway. And, and again, that that whatever law God had given them as a deterrent and ultimate punishment for breaking law. Ultimately, a lot of the punishments are meant to be deterrents. Uh, maybe that was whoever kills another, their blood shall be shed. You know, or something along that line. And Cain's like, if people, they know who I am. They know what I've done. They're going to try to kill me because that's what the law says. Uh, so, yeah, it, it is very interesting. Pam? Yeah, I'm not well, yeah, absolutely. Verse 14, I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and vagabond on the earth. Uh, certainly, to a certain extent, there already was separation because they'd been cast out of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had. But what... It seems like what Cain may be referring to, and you're right, he says, hidden from your face, but it's almost in the context of maybe that idea of protection or that idea of, of receiving, well, certainly he won't be receiving the blessing from the ground, but it, there's almost a, a sense of protection here that he will no longer have. Yeah, and that could be too, that he can't, can't go to God, maybe he won't be allowed to serve God in some capacity or, or sacrifice to him. And that could be too. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. If he had a change of heart, maybe it would have. Yeah, maybe it would. Of course, he, all of this that took place came, at least as far as we can tell, don't, he doesn't change. He doesn't repent uh, in any way other than saying the punishment is more than I can bear. Well, there's a reason for that. Right? that Yeah. Not serving the Lord, hating his brother, and all that. Yeah. I heard a great sermon one time just based on this thought that this is how false religions get their start. Is what Cain does here by introducing his own way. Interesting. A lot of things happen in 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 the name of religion. We go, ah, that's not that bad. Yeah. So today it might not seem that bad, but let it go and grow. And right. It is bad. Yeah. And. You know, I mean, of course, we don't read a lot about idolatry before the flood. That doesn't change. I mean, that doesn't mean that they there weren't worshiping of idols before that. We know that the hearts of men were evil continually. Uh, but it's very possible that kind of as a, 
alternative in his not being able to approach Jehovah, maybe he approached an idol instead. Maybe he made his own God, and that may have also contributed to the thoughts of men being evil continually. And that's a, that's a thought too. Yeah. Anything else through that? Okay. There are a whole bunch of fables attached to Cain. Uh, and for that matter, there's a whole bunch of fables attached to Abel as well that have no basis in Scripture at all. One of the myths that is popular is that Cain was actually a child of Satan and Eve based on 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 12. Now, 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 12, uh, notice verse 12, that Cain was of the wicked one. And the thought process was that it wasn't, in fact, Abel's, or, uh, uh, Adam's son at all, that Eve had had an affair with Satan, and thus was spawned Cain, and that Cain was literally of the, of the wicked one. Okay? First of all, how do we know that that's not true? How do we know for a fact that that's not what John means? Yeah, verse 1, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Okay, Moses doesn't record that Adam, you know, assumed it was his child, or that Eve had an affair, and that Adam just was kind of in the dark about the whole thing. It says, Adam was the father of Cain. So, unless we're saying that Moses was ignorant, or that God had lied to Moses regarding this, these facts, uh, or that in some way Moses was inaccurate, we got to say that 1 John 3, verse 12, when Cain was, quote, of the wicked one, what other possible meaning that fit scripture would John be referring to? His heart was of the wicked one. His thoughts were of the wicked, which is to say not specifically necessarily Satan or the devil, but for wicked things. Jealousy, envy, and as a, re as a recourse, he chose to kill his brother. And that's ultimately the context of which John is describing. He's not introducing some new genealogy understanding here. He's talking about loving our brethren versus hating our brethren. And Cain was one who hated his brother. Nolan? That's right. Is that literal? <laughs> right. That's a great point. Yeah, Jesus says, you're of your father, uh, the devil, and if that's the case, I mean, it, is it possible Jesus is speaking figuratively here, not literally? And, and that certainly fits with 1 John 3, 12 as well. Yeah, that's a great point. Anything else through that? All right, the second myth that I wanted to, to talk about that is actually far more common uh, that I know of at least two Christians, members of the Church of Christ, who had been taught or raised up to think this way, that the myth that the mark of Cain that is referenced here by God uh, giving him this mark was actually black skin, which, also, which people assume brought about the black-skinned individuals. Uh, and this was used by some Protestant churches as a defense for slavery. The idea that African Americans were of the spawn of Cain, therefore they have to be subjugated. And thus, for whatever reason, they thought that that was okay. Uh, some 19th and 20th century Baptist ministers taught that there were two separate heavens, one for black people and one for white people. And Brigham Young of the Mormon faith of Utah openly taught that the curse of Cain required slavery. Now, of course, the Mormon church has, has uh, disassociated itself from those statements of Brigham Young since then, but this was a common teaching, a common thought from the mid-1800s all the way up to 1960s, 1970s. And like I said, I know of two individuals who had been taught that when they were young, that that's the mark of Cain. Yes, ma'am. It's possible. I have not read anything specifically connecting the Catholic Church to that. 
Uh, but it is possible that that is part of the background as well. What I read specifically had to do with Protestant churches, particularly of the Baptist faith, as well as Mormon faith, specifically. Yes. So, how do we know for a fact that that's not the case? What, what two logical points make the case, I believe very clearly, that the mark of Cain wasn't the creation of a black-skinned people. Male or female, black or white, okay, you can include that. But there were black-skinned people in that day, certainly. The Ethiopian eunuch presumably probably was black-skinned. What about the fact that God's punishment, okay, Setting a mark on Cain. What, for what purpose was that mark? To know who he was. To know who, who was. Cain. Cain. Okay. God doesn't intimate in any way that this is something that would be genetic, that would be passed down to his children. Okay. That this was something specifically to acknowledge or identify Cain. So that people will not kill him. All right. Not a whole race of people. But what's the second, perhaps even more important or more uh, direct point that that mark isn't black skin? Okay, well, we don't inherit our father's sin, and that certainly carries with it the sense of, of the mark on Cain. Why would his children carry that mark if the sin was Cain's, and therefore the Warning not to kill him should not be, wouldn't be passed down to his children. Okay, that wouldn't make any sense. But what's going to happen in, oh, 1,500, 2,000 years or so, 1,500-ish, along the line? What major world event? The flood. And whose genealogy survives the flood? What what's son of, or sons of Adam? Seth, Cain's genealogy ends at the flood. So even if someone were to argue that the mark was black skin, that would not have carried through into Seth's family. In fact, as far as we can tell, I mean, there was no intermarrying, at least according to the genealogies, between Seth's family and uh, Cain's family. And so if the genealogy went through Seth and Cain's line ended at the flood, then there should be no mark if you're going to say it's genetic. So between those two points, and personally, I think that this one about the fact that it's specifically to identify Cain, not Cain's family lineage, but Cain himself for a set purpose. To me, that's as much evidence as we need. But even if that weren't the case and it was genetic, his line ended at the flood. So neither one of those suggestions in any way makes any kind of sense to argue, and certainly not even to enter into the whole conversation of the moral merits of slavery. All right? Anything else through that particular myth? All right. On our questions, we, we answer question one. What does the fact that Cain and Abel offered sacrifices to the Lord imply? It implies that there was a law. And that after Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, through God's revealing to them, either through the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, or separately from a, a uh, re revelation standpoint of the law, they knew what to sacrifice, they knew what to offer. And the fact that God rejected Cain's suggests, suggests that Cain knew better. That Cain had been given explicit instructions as to what to offer, and he didn't do that. Now, what are some possible reasons why God did not accept Cain's sacrifice? I can think of two major ones, which really are kind of connected. Okay, what, what, did, what did Hebrews 11 verse 4 say? By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. Whereas for Cain, maybe what he offered had nothing to do with faith. Maybe it was a sense of, of a burden, kind of like Malachi with the priests and the offering of the, at the altar. Oh, what a, oh, a weariness, Malachi, or God says, 
uh, in Malachi about the priest's thought process. Oh, what a weariness this is. Oh, what a burden. Oh, what a chore. So maybe Cain, in his mind, this wasn't about showing reverence to God. It wasn't about praising him or worshiping him or sacrifices. I've got to give my stuff to him. Fine. And so he takes whatever. What other possibility that might very well be connected there does that, does that involve? Yeah, that's what I'm, you know, that's interesting to me also that the Hebrew writer specifically points out that uh, the, the offering of the sacrifice, well, actually it wasn't the Hebrew writer, it's uh, here in Genesis, isn't it? Here in verse uh, 4, yeah, he brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. The fact that that's specifically pointed out that it's the firstborn, and we know that the firstborn and the best is something that would continue to be. Is it even a requirement of our sacrifices to God today? Absolutely. That has never changed, that God requires the full devotion and commitment of his people. That has always been the case. And the fact that that's pointed out here by Moses might very well also, in addition to speaking to his heart, his lack of of conviction or faith, not that he didn't believe, obviously he did, he has a conversation with God, but the fact that there wasn't that, that motivation of conviction there. So therefore, maybe he didn't offer the best of his crops. Maybe he offered the withering. Maybe he offered the, the old and decaying. Maybe he offered the, the plants that had died. Okay, that's the very same thing that God condemns the, the priests and the people for in Malachi. You offer me the lame, the blind, and the sick. And that's not what I want. That's not what I've commanded you. And so I can think of, of those two. And again, those two are connected in that if, and I think it is, about his heart. Okay. Then obviously, why would he offer the best in his sacrifice if his heart wasn't convicted to offer the best? Here, here's what I'm going to give you and you'll take it. <laughs> and what a chore, what a burden this is. Whereas Abel was fully committed to God, he gave the firstborn of his flock and did it so in faith. That's a direct contrast from Cain. Nolan? How could God not be satisfied with his good work and bringing him, doing a good work, and then saying, Well, it's an offering, it's to the Lord, it's to the right God, you know, it's the right place. Yeah. And it's still beautiful, it's still a beautiful thing, right? I mean, so why wouldn't God accept that any more than he would accept instrumental music versus singing? Because God has specified what he wants. And if we don't offer him what he wants, then what? Do we get to argue with God and say, well, you're going to take it anyway? No. Nadab and Abihu learned that the hard way. And so have countless others. And Jesus even references them in Matthew chapter 7 about those who are convinced that they've done things in the name of Jesus, but they didn't do it according to the will of the Father, and he calls them workers of lawlessness. Yeah, it's a great point. Do your own will. Oh, but I love the, the instruments, and I love the... Well, that's fine. You can love the instruments. Go listen to the radio. Okay, listen to some classic music if you want. But that doesn't mean it has to be done in the worship service of God when God says, I want you to sing. And it's, and it's, that's a very emotional talk. People get upset if you start talking about worship and you start talking about instrumental music. I've had several people get very defensive, very upset. I love instrumental music. Well, so do I. But it has no place in the worship of God. All right. Anything else? If, if, God, if God had commanded specifically animal, and that's another thought I hadn't considered, if God had commanded specifically animal sacrifice, then, and Cain just brought, well, you know, Abel is, you know, he's a, he's a shepherd, so of course he's going to use his sheep. Why should I have to buy or trade some of my fruit or veggies for, for a sheep? I'm just going to offer God what I make and go from there. 
And that's possible. I hadn't thought about that. It's possible that the requirement specifically was an animal sacrifice. Certainly, there were grain and peace offerings in the Mosaical Law that would have included wheat and stuff like that. But sin offerings particularly required, required an animal, required blood. And if that was a part of this law, whatever law this was that Adam and Eve had been given, then Cain certainly didn't seem to put much interest or care in what he gave to God for that. Maybe he's like me, there were certain vegetables he wanted to burn. <laughs> all, the, all the turnips and the beets and stuff he put in there, yeah. All right, for what reason or reasons do you think that Cain killed Abel? What was his motivation? What was his thought process? I mean, is this really going to change anything? And, and why isn't he angry at God? Why is he angry at Abel? If he has beef with God, take it up with God. Why do you take it up with Abel? Say what? Well, okay, he can't do anything to God. That's true. What else? Okay, his younger brother. Pride, I think, was probably a component there. Yeah, well, Abel, you know, Cain's mad, and Abel's like, well, you could have done what you were supposed to do, and that would have kind of prevented this whole situation. And that kind of what God said, if you have done well, it would have been so inside, you really do. Yeah, yep. Okay, so he was convicted by Abel's example. All right. Jealousy and anger, certainly. All right. What do you think the goal was? What, what, what do you think the end result in his mind that this was going to accomplish? Because I don't, I don't buy the sense that this was a crime of, of passion or a crime of anger, that this is something he just kind of all of a sudden decided. I think this is something he's really premeditated on. He's thought about this. And if things didn't go his way and whatever that conversation was they had, he was going to kill them. That's what I wonder. Because if you eliminate the standard, well, then what else do you have but to accept Cain's standard? If you eliminate the, the best standard there is, which was Abel's sacrifice, then there's no one else to compete with. I mean, presumably Adam and Eve. But Cain is the one at the, in, the, in the situation, or Cain and Abel are the ones in the situation. If I eliminate Abel, and obviously our standard here is comparing one to the other. And that was Cain's mistake was that in his mind, Abel's sacrifice raised the standard so that his, by comparison to Abel's, was unacceptable. If I eliminate Abel, well, then all that's left is mine, and God will accept that. And it's really interesting because uh, how does that, in fact, how does that apply to us? today. And for that matter, to a certain extent, Christians, the, the temptation of the mindset that some Christians may have, or the temptation to have. Okay. Sometimes it, it can be, it can be tricky and, and tempting to think myself, well, I'm a far better Christian than brother so-and-so. Or I'm a far better Christian than so, the sister so-and-so. And as a result, if certainly I'm going to get to heaven compared to them. But if we start comparing ourselves to one another, that's going to lower the standard. Because with each new, I mean, we're basically as faithful as the lowest standard of faithfulness there is. But the standard of faith is whom? It's Jesus. It is that to which we are to compare ourselves. It is that to which we are to mold ourselves. This isn't about us. I heard a, a pro golfer say one time that you're not, when you're out on, in a tournament playing golf, you're not competing against the other golfers. That's a trap. A lot of golfers get in the trap and think I'm competing against the others. So as long as I can get, you know, one beneath the stroke from him and so forth, he says, you have to compete against the course. Because the course is the standard. And if you leave that in your mind, that you're competing against the standard, then it doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. You're doing what you, the best you can to follow the standard of the course. 
And I think that is a very biblical concept. And unfortunately, I wonder if Cain fell into that trap. All right, we will stop there. We will pick up with the rest of these questions and Abel next Wednesday. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>